So we'll continue. Um, we'll continue integration by parts today, maybe even finish it. Um, so maybe we should do a few more examples. I mean, I can tell you, I can tell you the three major integrals that appear in applications, like in physics and engineering, which admittedly are not most of your majors, but these are the three sort of most significant integrals that routinely get addressed using parts. And then there were a few special integrals as well. Um, we've done this. I mean, this is done in basically the same way. Here, we did it by letting u equal x, dv equals the sine of x. This Second example is in a sense important, but it's so similar to the first example. Morning. Morning. So let's do this as the next example we work through. It's a very clean integration by parts problem. As far as selecting U goes, if we remember this acronym, we've got an algebraic function. X is algebraic. And we've got an exponential function. Good morning. E to the X is exponential. Good morning. Um, so in this sort of Memory aid, A comes before E. So we'll try that in U be the um, algebraic function. So if we let U be the algebraic function, then um, that leaves D to be E to the X. And to do integration by parts, we need DU. And we need B. One of those is differentiation, and one of them is integration. To go from U to DU is a derivative. To go from DV to V is the opposite. It's an integral. Now, the integral of E to the X is E to the X. And now, integration by parts is kind of a process. I mean, we um, we sort of are just plugging and playing. We've got the formula: u of v minus the integral of v du. But I can't say that we're almost done necessarily because integration by parts does require us to take an integral still. And we have to see if the integral we get is easier than the one we started out with. U times V is X times e to the x minus the integral 
Great. Good news. This is good news. V D U is e to the x times one. So we are left with an integral we can cope with. The integral of e to the x is e to the x. And we get this. And that's throw in our constant of integration. So there's this integral. We have done, I was saying earlier, these are the three examples that show up most commonly in application. And these first two examples are so similar. We did one of them yesterday, that's fine. Now we've done the third example. But there are still cases we should look at. I mean, being the most important examples isn't the same as being the only important example. Let's look at a case where integration by parts works, but is but is a little more complicated. Let's try x squared times the cosine of x. So Maybe it's a defect that when I'm standing here on the board, I just tend to rush into these. This is an integration by parts example. So we'll use integration by parts. Here's like it. I mean, if we pause a while and look at this problem, why am I using integration by parts? Well, Integration by parts is the only technique, I shouldn't say that, it's one of two techniques we have that let us deal with products. And the only other technique we have, we mainly use when we have composition. So this is a product, but it's also a composition. There's one function in another. And nine times out of 10, um, this is sort of the signifier for u substitution. So we have a product. We don't have any composition. Um, that means of parts and of U substitution, the two techniques we've learned which involve products, parts is probably the thing to try. So following around Lyot, X squared is algebraic. Um, I maybe people find Lyot a little like, how do you define an algebraic function? But it's, you know, x's and squares and addition and subtraction and powers and division, sort of the functions that you build out of x without using trigonometry or exponentiation. So, x squared is algebraic. The cosine of x is trigonometric. So according to Lyot, we should try letting u be our algebraic function. That's x squared. And that leaves the cosine of x dx. to be a D of E. So let's see if Lyot works and integration by parts works. 
and we wind up with an integral we can take. I mean, again, the integration by parts takes an integral and it replaces it with another integral. So the question is always going to be, well, is this new integral better than the old integral? Let us see what happens. We've suggested that we should try letting u be our algebraic function. And that leaves d of e as the cosine of x dx. <clears throat> and now, we need du, finding du is easy. I mean, to the extent that anything is easy in calculus, it's a derivative. Finding v is an integral. And finding v might be easy, might be hard, might be completely impossible, and you have to go back to the drawing. In this case, the antiderivative of the cosine is the sine. Incidentally, if you struggle with these, I always have to sort of go through in my head. Okay, the derivative of the sine is the positive cosine, the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. So if you uh, if you still have to pause with this integral, then you're in the exact same position I'm in. No uh, problem there. And now we can put these together and we can see if integration by parts works, essentially, u times v, x squared times the sine of x minus the integral of v du. Well, good news, bad news. Is the good news is that the integral of 2x times the sine of x is certainly a simpler integral than x squared times the cosine of x. I say things like that, I'm never sure how sort of obvious they are. 2x is a first degree polynomial. It is a simpler expression than x squared. Meanwhile, the sine of x and the cosine of x are the same in terms of simplicity. They have almost identical graphs, basically the same properties. So we have made things as simple but we haven't made things simple enough. We still have a product. We still have x times the sine of x. Um, so what do we do? Give up, try something else. Well, the Disappointing, uh, disappointing just because it's a little tedious, I always feel. Answer is, you know, this is an integration by parts problem. So we just hit this new integral by integration by parts again. And you could have like x to the seventh 
times the cosine of x. And you'd have to use integration by parts seven times or whatever. I think using integration by parts twice is about the limit of, of complexity that I want to uh, reach in this class. In fact, this is an opportunity. I was just thinking that I wanted to have you do a problem for me, an integration by parts problem. And here is an integration by parts problem that's fallen into our lamp. Why don't you help me finish this out? by computing this integral for me. Yeah. Okay, so somebody tell me what they let you be here. Two X, I agree with that. We've got, once again, an algebraic function times a trig function. In fact, this is very close to the, this might be the first example we did, except without the two. I actually can't remember if it was X sine or X cosine, but will that U be the um, algebraic function? That leaves D of E to be the trig function. Finding the U is differentiation, hopefully a relatively straightforward process by now. Finding V is integration and going back to what I said earlier, I always have to just spend a second. Let's see the derivative of the cosine is the negative sine. Don't want a negative. So the derivative of the negative cosine is the positive sine. And now we put these together. U times V. Let me separate this. U times V is negative 2x times the cosine of x minus the integral of V via U. So negative two times the cosine of X dx. And now we're very close. Let's try not to make any goofy little errors just in front of the finish line. We can pull. We can pull negative signs out of integrals. So this negative sign and this negative sign, once they're sitting next to each other, will turn into addition. Let's see. This integral, the two just sits there. In fact, we could pull the two totally out of the integral if we wanted to. The derivative of the sine is the positive cosine. So here's, um, here's our antiderivative. We're not, uh, we'll put the constant of integration in at the very end. I'm not worried about that at the moment. 
So here's what I get. Is this what you got too? Anyone got something different? I'll take that rounding silence to mean that nobody wants to ask me why they got something different. So here's the uh, here's the integral we have. And this integral is part of the integral we're actually looking for. So let's get our actual answer. Our actual answer is x squared times the sine of x. minus this integral. So negative two x cosine x plus two sine x. And now, this is the integral we were really looking for. I'll definitely remember my constant of integration here. And I mean, it would be more normal to simplify this a little. I mean, this, this negative sign is going to distribute over the stuff in the parentheses x squared times the sine of x plus 2x times the cosine of x minus 2 times the sine of x plus c. Integration by parts does tend to give some pretty uh, pretty lengthy answers. And the frustrating thing about integration by parts, it's usually very hard to check your work. Like the derivative of this is supposed to be x squared times the cosine of x but differentiating this is ugly and difficult enough that it's a little hard to do. I mean, you need to be using your product rule. So let's just circle our answer and move on. There are still things to say about integration by parts. There are a few others, other sort of famous integrals that involve integration by parts in some way. And one of those famous integrals is funny because it does not look like an integration by parts problem at all. The integral of the natural logarithm of x. So as I say, this doesn't look like an integration by parts problem. And the reason it doesn't look like an integration by parts problem is that integration by parts is a tool for integrating a product. And we have no product here. We just have the natural log sitting there by itself. Nevertheless, this integral is approached using 
um, using integration by parts and the trick, and it definitely is a trick. I think it's fair to call it that. But the trick is to think of the natural log of X as being one times the natural log of X. Again, a pretty goofy trick, but it's going to work out. It's um, if we think of the natural log of X as a product in this way, we will be enabled, we will be able to find this integral. And this integral, I mean, we know integration by parts gives us sort of funky answers. I, this isn't an integral that I've ever memorized. It's not an integral I'd really recommend you memorize. It's one of those things where if I need it, I look it up online, but we can at least see where it comes from. So in terms of light, one is algebraic. So we've got a logarithm and we've got an algebraic function. And our trick, our guideline is to let you be the first thing that appears in this list so that you be the logarithm. And that leaves it B of E to be whatever's left. In this case, D of E is one DX. And DU is really nice. The reason that Lyot starts with an L is because the logarithm becomes much simpler when you integrate it, when you differentiate it, sorry. V is going to be complicated a little. D of E is one, the integral of one is X. So we're making that one DX a little more complicated, but we're making that natural logarithm of X much simpler. And if we use the integration by parts formula, Really, once we, once we put this trick in and showed you how to proceed, this problem becomes pretty routine. U times V. So X times the natural log of X minus the integral of V du and when we multiply x by one divided by x those terms cancel and turn into one so this is the integration by parts formula. Sometimes, 
student stumble a little here, just because this integral is so simple that we basically never do examples involving it. The antiderivative of a constant is the constant times x. So the antiderivative of one is one x. plus a constant of integration. So there, there is the integral of the natural log of x. And all of the examples I've done using integration by part, um, have been indefinite integrals. I mean, there's nothing really special to say about definite integrals. You use the fundamental theorem of calculus exactly as normal. So if we... If we had a definite integral, we would find the antiderivative using the same steps we just used, x o and x minus x. We'd plug in one, we'd plug in two and I don't have my calculator loaded up, but we would plug this into our calculator and we would get whatever we get. So definite integrals are still, here's the fundamental theorem no special tricks involving them. This trick, this trick works um, on a few other integrals as well. Um, this is on your quiz. But but we can talk a little about it in class. This is precisely the same trick you use if you want the integral of the arc tangent. By which I mean, if you want the integral of the arc tangent, you think of the arc tangent as one times the arc tangent. So here's a nice little example. So far, we've done problems where U is logarithmic, and we've done problems where U is algebraic. Sandwiched between those is inverse trig functions. So Lyot here says, let U be the arc tangent and dv will then be one. And when you see it, I don't think any of us look at one over one plus x squared and think, what a nice, simple function, but it's simpler than the arc tangent. 
I mean, the arc tangent is a real piece of work. And once again, V is X. The integral of one is X. And if you put these together, I mean, I'll just, I'll just do this. You can then reproduce this work for the quiz. U times V is X times the arc tangent of X. And then we'll have V D U X times the arc tangent of X minus the integral of X over one plus X squared. Well, let me write. Here's the derivative. Here's So there's a V du. Um, again, this is the kind of thing that students sometimes sort of get slightly confused with, just again, because it's so elementary that people almost never bother to talk about it. That might be a mistake. We can think of X as X over one. So to do this product, we multiply the denominators, we multiply the numerators, and this product ends up looking like this. Well, good news, bad news, I guess. We, uh, we haven't learned any technique, any really good techniques for integrating quotients. In fact, I'll go one further and say there aren't any good techniques for integrating quotients. So that's the bad news. The good news is that the one trick we did learn, it's very situational, but it works here. is to try to approach quotients as a U substitution. And I hate the fact that U gets used in substitution and U gets used in integration by parts, and it means different things in depending on which of those processes you're using. Terrible choices of notation, too late to fix now. There are now centuries of tradition behind it. But I am not doing integration by parts here. I am doing U substitution. And what makes a U substitution here so situational, the reason that we can't use this for any quotient, I mean, we could always let U be the denominator of the fraction, but to actually use U substitution, we need DU up here. So like if instead of X, we had the square root of x, we would not be able to proceed. But we've gotten very lucky here. Let me just edge that integral slightly left. We've gotten very lucky um, because we want 2x. We don't have the 2. But this is hopefully an old familiar trick by now. If we want a constant that we don't have, we put that constant in and we divide by it.
And now we are Gordon. At least we're hopefully Gordon. We're Gordon if we remember how to integrate one over u. It's the natural log. Sorry, ran out of space. The integral of one over u is the natural log of the absolute value of u. Minus one half the natural log u is one plus x squared all plus c. Let me let me uh, separate. Ooh, what a nice nice thick line. Separate the answer from the uh, problem. And you have to, I guess, sort of consult your own conscience <laughs> in terms of how much you want to worry about those absolute values, because we could simplify this just a little further. We could recognize that one plus x squared is always positive. And the absolute value of a positive number doesn't do anything. So we could turn these into parentheses, but I wouldn't worry too much about that sort of thing. Also, I mean, this is not, I don't know why, sorry, um, let me finish this. Um, this is just like the natural log. This is not an integral you should commit to memory. Um, it's something, I mean, the internet is making this very easy. Um, but also, I mean, it used to be you would buy like these volumes of integrals with like, well, maybe not volume, but like these sort of booklets of integrals with just lists of hundreds of integrals that you would look up as you needed them. We're still seeing the remnants of that in the back of our books. Obviously, in this day and age, it might be easier to just type into Google what is integral of arctangent, please. But however you look it up, you just look it up. You wouldn't uh, memorize this. OK. I I don't know why our uh, our whiteboard how it has been set for some kind of foreign language, but if those uh, I don't think it's not negative nineteen degrees Celsius out. Okay, but be that as it may, stay warm out there. Be careful walking around. Campus. Some people have tripped and fallen recently, and I will see you uh, tomorrow. We'll finish up integration by parts, and then we'll probably start the next section as well.